Reconciliation. Ooh, hard topic. We, we've been talking about Joseph, and we've seen Joseph be thrown in a pit and then be raised up. And then he was thrown in a jail, accused of being an adulterer. And, but in the jail, he was continued to be raised up. Finally, we got to the point where Pharaoh had a dream. And in this dream, it so greatly troubled Pharaoh. And Pharaoh didn't w uh, just wipe this off as, as something that, you know, just kind of happens or maybe the chili he ate last night. It bothered him and he knew it was significant. And, and all of his wise men couldn't tell Pharaoh what this dream meant. But then, if you'll remember, the cupbearer remembered the man in prison. And the man in prison came before Pharaoh and he told him, he said, Pharaoh, this is what's getting ready to happen. You're going to have seven amazing years of plenty. But then you will have seven years of drought. And in this seven years of drought, he said, you will need somebody to be able, that will put the, the grain away during these years of plenty and then be able to ration it out so that the Egyptian people will continue to live. Pharaoh said, say no more. You're that man, obviously, because God has given you wisdom and insight to be able to do this. You, I will put you second in command. Now keep in mind, Joseph is not an Egyptian. He is an Israelite. But if you remember, he had a dream way back there that the sun and the moon and the stars would, be call, would, would bow down to him. Well, they, they originally took that to mean that the son would be his father. But in this case, the Pharaoh was commonly known as a representation of the sun god. And it's interesting that the sun god says, I'm going to put you in charge of our food, our very life essence. Even though you are a foreigner, I have that kind of confidence in you. Suddenly, Joseph's in charge. But today we're going to talk about something that was back there in the back. Something that happened probably around 15 years before this. 15 years before this, his brothers threw him in a pit. And that's how he wound up in Egypt. They even went so far to think that maybe we should kill him. But they decided instead to sell him as a slave. But finally, it came time for Joseph to do that. Reconciliation is not easy. It goes beyond forgiveness because forgiveness says, I have forgiven you for what you've done, but I don't have to have any use to do with you. No, reconciliation says, I forgive you and I'm putting you back in a place where you could hurt me again. It goes contrary to everything we want to believe about ourselves. It's, a, it's, it's this contrary feeling because we don't like being hurt, especially by those that are close to us because that's where the knife seems to cut the deepest. I wanted to, re I wanted to read you a story because this isn't just uh, limited to what Joseph is being asked. This has been asked of Christians all over the world. On the Lord's Day, a group of missionaries and believers in New Guinea were gathered together to observe the Lord's Supper. And after one young man sat down, a missionary recognized that a sudden tremor had passed through the young man's body that indica indicated that he was under a great nervous strain. And then in a moment, all was quiet again. The missionary whispered, What was it that, you, that troubled you? Ah, he said, But the man who just came in killed and ate the body of my father. But now he has come in to remember the Lord with us. At first I didn't know whether I could endure it, but it is all right now. He is washed in the same precious blood. And so together they had communion. How hard that must be. And we've heard various stories along these ilk, whether it was Corey Tinboon who had to forgive the man who imprisoned her so far back during the uh, uh, 
uh, when she was in, a, in one of the prison camps. She met the man that had imprisoned her, that was one of the jailers, and, and she talked about how hard that was. But Christians are often called to do the impossible act of forgiving the ones that have scarred them, sometimes the deepest. We turn to the scriptures, and we're here to the po point that the famine has not just hit Egypt, but also Israel. So Joseph's 10 older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain, but Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother Benjamin go with them for fear some harm may come to them. They come to, they come to Egypt. The story goes on from there. And it's almost like fate has put them back in. The very same catastrophe has caused Joseph to have to face his past. The brothers come before him to ask for grain from the great uh, uh, person that has to shell out the grain. I don't know what you're going to call him, the great vizier. But he, they, they come before him and they don't recognize him. But bow down low and tell the, him that we are your neighbors. We have come to buy grain. And Joseph sees him. Now, I thought about this this week. <laughs> I said, maybe I wouldn't recognize my own brother if he was standing there before me in makeup and a headdress. But anyways, they didn't recognize him. So Joseph agrees to let them buy grain. But before they go, he accuses them of being spies. Because Joseph wants to know what's going on back in his home country. And he notices that his youngest brother, probably who had just been born a few years before Joseph was lost, wasn't with him. And he tells them, if you're going, he said, I don't believe you, take your grain and go, but one of you is gonna have to stay here. And it because, until you bring your younger brother to prove to me that you're not spies. They elected Simeon. And Simeon, has to stay. Joseph puts him in prison. Now I thought this was, I was thinking about this this week and this is the first time I saw this. I've read this story many times. I've always assumed that Joseph is acting out of a vengeance. But I don't believe that's what it was. I believe that Joseph is acting out of curiosity to see if they would learn their lesson. They leave to go back. And when they get back home, they, they tell their father everything and they said, but we have to take Benjamin back because we have to get Simeon out of prison. And the father says, no, you can't take Benjamin. He's the only child of my favorite wife, which is a great thing to say to your sons. But <laughs> he said, you can't take him. And, and so they, they just sit and leave Simeon in the prison while they work through the grain that they gave him. But as all things happen, they run out of grain. And they've got to go back. And they remind dad that they can't go back without Simeon because then he'll just throw all of them in prison. Or without Benjamin, because then he'll just throw all of them in prison. And so... They, uh, uh, they convinced dad. They said, we'll protect him with our life. They convinced him to let them go with him, to, to, to take him with them. But the thing was, the last time they went, when they got home, they found all their money in the top of their sacks. So they were also a little leery to return because they were afraid of being accused of stealing because all their money was in top of their sacks. So they thought to, to finish this off, and it went this way. The men packed Jacob's gifts and doubled the money. They doubled the money that they was returned in their sacks. And they headed off with Benjamin. And they finally arrived in Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of his household, These men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace. Then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. Well, now, not only were they given the grain, but they're invited to sit with the second in command at his table for lunch. This was a great honor that King reserved. But if you sat at the king's table, you were served the same food they served him. 
And Joseph, being like the Pharaoh of Egypt, of Egypt would have been had the choice of stuff. And the brothers were afraid. They didn't know why they were sitting there. Because it was well known that Egyptians weren't real wild about Israelites. They weren't real wild about their neighbors. Kind of like sometimes we can be. You know, in the hospital, it's not just um, white American speaking people that work there. We have some foreign doctors. And sometimes I hear comments about our foreign doctors. And it's that same thing. They, they, don't, they don't like people not sounding like themselves. This, is still ha this, this happened back in Egypt. This happens today. But anyway, it must have really irked them the fact that an Israelite was over them. So anyways, but we, we, that's a little aside, free. But anyway, we get back to this story. And they're sitting at the table. And once again, their grain sacks are then filled. And they get ready to set, they get ready to set off that next morning. And, and once again, Joseph put all their money back in their sacks. When his brothers were ready to leave, Joseph gave these instructions to his palace manager. Fill each of their sacks with as much grain as they can carry. Am I still, I'm not, I haven't done my thing. I'm sorry, I'm not so used to, where am I? There we are. I need 44, 1 through 4. There we go. Okay. As much as they can carry and put each man's money back into his sack. Then put my personal silver cup at the top of the youngest brother's sack along with the money for his grain. So the manager did as Joseph instructed him. The brothers were up at dawn and were sent on their journey with their loaded donkeys. But when they had gone only a short distance and were barely out of the city, Joseph said to the palace manager, Chase after them and stop them. When you catch up with them, ask them, Why have you repaid my kindness with such evil? Once again, the lesson continues. Joseph brings them before him and they're crying. Because they, they had said that if any one of us has stolen this cup, let him take that man's life. And it was Benjamin, the very one they swore to protect because it would break their father's heart if something were to happen. And Joseph wanted to see what was, what was going to happen. And what happens is Judah, the very one that was kind of leading the child, that actually sold him into slavery, puts himself down in front of Joseph and says to him, and now my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving white-haired man to his grave. Somewhere along the way, somewhere in the 15 years that Joseph had been away, something strange had happened. They had begun to have compassion for each other. Something had happened. They had grown. And this is not uncommon. I, I, I rarely think that we're the same people we were when we were, when we were growing up. We grow. But Joseph saw this, that they weren't willing to sacrifice each other for each other. And, 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 and Judah stands in front of him and, and pleads to even give his own life. And that broke Joseph. Joseph could stand it no longer. There are many people in the room. And he said to his attendants, Out! All of you! So he was alone with his brothers when he t told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him. And word of it carried quickly to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you've sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. 
This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of this entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Joseph didn't see in his normal circumstances. Why is this germane? Why is this, why does this, why is this still relevant today? Well, you don't have to talk to people for too long and they'll tell you things about people. They'll say, I ain't talked to that blankety blank for, for 30 years because of something he did to me back there. They're living in the past. They're living in the past. And Joseph realized that his past is what got him here to today. And that's a call that all Christians have to realize. That maybe the pains of our past are what helped us to get to where we are today. They gave us our families. They did, did all kinds of things. Maybe those very pains that, we, that hurt us so badly were the very things that led us to our happiness today. I wanted to, and I want to show why I've taken this time for Joseph. Because we've preached about him for four weeks and we're going to wrap up next week. But I want to show you why I've taken this time with Joseph. Because I feel like he's a very important figure. And really, he's what we call in the, in the uh, uh, biblical scholar world, 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 sorry, as a shadow of Jesus, a type and a shadow of Jesus. In that he reflected Jesus and who he was to come. Because Jesus' own brothers and mother tried to get him thrown into the crazy bin. They got worried. The pressures of society got to them and they wanted to take Jesus away and get him out of the spotlight. They abandoned him. But then, like I've told you before, James and Jude would go on to realize that Jesus was the truth. And they also would write books. Jesus' brothers had to come to realize that he was the tr that that sorry, Joseph's brothers had to come to realize that Joseph had become the great and mighty thing that he had said he would back when he was a boy. So I, I put this together. I put this together, and it's a picture of, of what the children of God should look like. It says, they put God above, above family, and not, not the one that you're in charge of, but the family that had you, and others who have used them wrongly. That's what Joseph had done. He, he put God above all of those people that had done him wrongly and, was, and continued to be an upstanding person of what he was called to be. Even though they're foreigners, they treat others as God's own. Why is this germane? Because you're, you're, you live in America, you work with Americans. But, but there's a verse that in the Bible that says that we are foreigners here, strangers. This land is not our home. And even, even if Joseph had been in his own land, he would have been a foreigner because he didn't do things for, for who, who had hired him. He did things for God. So he did them with excellence. And therefore, we too are foreigners. We don't have to do it for the person in front of us. I've had, to, I've had some bad bosses. I've had some good bosses. But I don't have to do my job just for them. I have to do it for God above. And you too have that same calling on you if you're a Christian is you're not working for yourself. You're working to reflect the God that's inside of you. Refuse to hold grudges, which provides uh, uh, reconciliation. We have to have that. We have to look beyond who people once were. And when we see that they are not the same person, we have to be willing to forgive. 
We have to show that we're not the same person because you're not. What, what, what's that verse say? Behold, we are a new creation in Christ. And if you are a new creation, you put to death the old things and become more like God. See, what, what Christians don't get is they try to hold on to the familial ties back here. The people that raised them. Mom, dad, brothers and sisters. They try to listen to that. But the problem is, is that you, the Bible says, Paul says you're grafted into a new family. You've been grafted into it. That's like, a, that's like where they take a, 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 a branch of one plant and then they transplant it into another plant. And then they bind it together and after you know, a reasonable amount of time, you can't tell that, that one plant, you can't take it apart and it lives. Because it is, it has now become that other plant. You've been grafted into another family. So don't be surprised when you don't do the same things that your old family used to do. We talked about this that first week. Now, now we're talking about this and that we shouldn't hold our families back there or, or others that have been in our past to the same standards that we hold other Christians. We have to be willing to reconcile with them. We have to show them that they don't have the power over us. Because if you're not willing to reconcile with them, they now have power over you. What if, what if Joseph had sunk back into those family grudges? Would he still be the second in all of Egypt? Maybe. But Pharaoh put him there because Joseph wasn't like anybody else. He said this in, the, in an earlier scripture, that Joseph was like no one else. But if he starts saying that Joseph would, he would even harm his own family, maybe he starts having some, some uh, questions. We're going to, uh, I want to leave with this one last verse. Then the band's going to come up and I'm going to close with some, th with some final thoughts. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. It says, since God chose you to be the holy people, he loves you. You must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. In, one, in, in Mark, it records that Jesus said, after, after all the Beatitudes, it said that he said that if you can't forgive others, how can your heavenly Father be get, forgive you? And in other words, it's a part of your nature now. If we're going to believe in this forgiving God. And reconciliation is what God has to do with us each time we screw up. Each time we don't come up to his mark. He puts us back into a place where we can hurt him. Where we can hurt him again. Every time. And if we can trust him to do that, we have to be able to trust others. And be able to put them back in those places. Letting them back... Is this easy? Absolutely not. It hurts. I, I know, I, I know, I've seen a lot of families that where there's been a long list of grievances against somebody and, and they just decide they're going to cut them out of their lives completely. But we have to be able to forgive them as we've been forgiven. Band are going to play for just a minute, and then we're. Uh, then I want to come up, and we'll do some things. Sorry, my clicker's not working like it used to. May have to change the batteries. <laughs> the kindness you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace.
giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but see. Trust him when he says, Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up higher and higher. And he will lift you up. want to wrap up real quick. I read, I found this eight things by a guy named Roy Smith. And he says, as you're having trouble to forgive, you need to begin by assuring yourself that compared to Christ's suffering, you haven't been seriously wronged by all, at all. Recall the many kind deeds that you've shown to you, perhaps even by the person who has harmed you. List the benefits you have received from the Lord and thank Him for blessing you for his love, with His love and forgiveness each day. 
Make an honest effort to pray for the one who has injured you. Go even further by looking for an opportunity to help them. And if the offense is especially hard to forget, try to erase the memory by thinking gracious and generous thoughts. Finally, before you fall asleep at night, repeat slowly and thoughtfully that praise from the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Father, we just thank you. We know that, that Father, forgiveness alone is hard enough, but reconciliation almost goes beyond what some of us are able to do. But Father, we're not our own. And we, we, we're, not, we're not who we were. And Father, through you, we have become that new creation that we talked about. And that Father, we too want to be as our Father does. I go around blessing those who curse you and doing good for those that speak ill of us. Because we are yours and you are ours. And because of that, we become imitators of you. I thank you for everyone here. Father, I also want to thank you for the rain that's, that's coming. Father, we just believe that, that our dry ground is, is, not, is not a condition of our hearts. But Father, that we open, up, we open up and receive what you've given us here today. And Father, just as we have received from your word and your nurturement, nourishment, we expect our grounds to receive that same way. We thank you that we are not our own, that we put our trust in you, and that we give you all the praise and glory and believe that you go before us, preparing us a table at our enemies. And Father, that you continue to work with us until the day we see you face to face. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Yeah. Would, ever, would some people come around and we want to pray for her? We just want to see Linda completely and totally healed. She's dealt with this quite a bit. I, mean, I think, what are you, about seven months now? Seven, eight months? Okay. 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 Amen. Well, Father God, we just rebuke the devourer. And we, Father, the, the things that come that try to eat away at our health and, and are, are attacking us. Father, we believe that you're here today for Linda, that you're giving her new strength, a new grace, a new favor. And Father, that for all the things that the enemy has tried to take from her, we ask, we believe that she has a right to restoration completely and totally. And thank you that your peace of presence is upon her, that she is no longer her own, and that you're continuing to heal her body inside and out, Father God, so that she can have, she can walk in with victory. Just, just like we've seen already in the, in the testimony. Uh, the, the, Father, that she can go in there with the full faith and confidence, knowing that her God has went before her and that it has made a way where, where they've tried to tell her there is no way, where they've tried to tell her that, there, that it's a continuing thing, it's an ongoing process, it's always going to be an ongoing process. We, we, just, we just say that may be in the natural, but that's, that's not for us. We're, we, are your, we are yours and you are ours. And Linda has claimed your, your, your daughtership as, as, uh, over herself and that she is no longer her own. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If there's no one else, go in peace. What are you guys doing? Crazy monkeys.